welcome everybody. So in today's podcast, we will be discussing recovery during the pandemic and how we can support students in recovery. Our um, guest speaker today, Thaddeus, will share his own experience with recovery and his experience working with students in recovery. Um, we're just going to start by introducing ourselves, and then I will um, introduce Thaddeus, and then we will start um, with learning a little bit more about um, recovery here at St. Cloud State and his experience. So my name is Samantha. Um, I am the co-advisor for Active Minds. Hi, my name is Alexis Schreiber. I'm one of the co-presidents of Active Minds, and I'm a second year clinical mental health graduate student. My name is Aaron Sadlow. I am the other co-president of Active Minds, and I am a Spanish and psychology major. Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm a social work student here at SCSU. Hi, um, my name is Charlene Hanish Tyson. I am the advisor of Active Minds, as well as a clinical mental health um, therapist here in the Counseling and Psychological Services on campus in Eastman Hall. So our guest speaker today, Thaddeus Ripka, is the recovery community coordinator at St. Cloud State. He began working with the community as a um, graduate student coming from a successful undergraduate experience in recovery community at Augsburg College. After graduating with his Master of Business Administration, he returned to work as a coordinator of the program. The Recovery Resource Center is located in Eastman Hall and provides a safe space and supportive community for students at St. Cloud State and St. Cloud Technical and Community College in recovery or seeking recovery from a substance use disorder. Participation in the RRC is completely voluntary and there is no barrier to entry. Students at any stage of recovery and at any point in their academic journey are welcome. The RRC offers both a resource center and residential community for students in recovery that are committed to continuing their education. All right, and I will pass it on to you, Alexis, to start us off. Cool. So to start off with, would you be willing to share a bit of your story and how, did, how you ended up in the role of recovery community coordinator? Yeah, well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor and I appreciate the exposure to, uh, to the program I work for and uh, addiction recovery. Um, so my name is Thaddeus Ripka. I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't had a drink or a drug since February 2nd, 2010. Um, and yeah, so a couple of days ago, I celebrated 11 years in recovery. Awesome. So I'm really, uh, feels good. Uh, it's, uh, you know, recovery, gosh, has given me so many gifts. Uh, trust in my family's back. Uh, true genuine friends today of a college education. I'm a proud uh, alum of St. Cloud State. I got my MBA here in 2014. Uh, the obsession to drink and use has been lifted. I don't obsess about using anymore, which is a miracle. Uh, but best of all is I have purpose in my life and um, I'm in the awesome position to, to help students here at St. Cloud State in recovery navigate college uh, help them stay sober and just help them be their best selves. Um, so I'm really, really fortunate for that. And, you know, to answer your other question about how I got into this field, I kind of was kind of stumbled into it. Um, you know, I heard about collegiate recovery when I was in treatment uh, at Hazelden uh, down in Plymouth. And uh, you right then and there, that's where I needed to go to college because I was a college dropout myself. I, uh, you know, tried to, tried to do college sober by myself and uh, did not, was unsuccessful. And so when I heard about programs like Augsburg's and ours that have a dedicated program for students in recovery, I knew right then and there, that's where I needed to go. If I was, were to have any genuine college experience. Um, so I enrolled, I finished my undergrad in two, two years. I had two and a half years to complete. I did in two years in my last semester, the stars kind of aligned. I was about to graduate and I was one of the RAs for the community. So I was one of the community leaders and uh, a fellow hall director, well not a fellow, but a colleague, uh, hall director approached me and said, hey, there's this opportunity at St. Cloud State. They're starting their own program. They need a student that has leadership experience that wants to go to grad school and help establish this program. And I'm like, yeah, that's me, but I really don't want to go to grad school. <laughs> but I, they're just like, well, they're going to pay for it basically. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's a no, 
easy decision. So uh, that's how I found myself at St. Cloud State. And we started with one student in our program, our first year. And he has since graduated with his undergrad and his master's. He's getting married in September. He owns a house with his fiance. And I think he's coming up on eight or nine years here in February too. So he's a rock star. And, you know, we've, we've grown from one student to we, you know, I work with over 20 right now. So it's been a, a journey to build the program and we've evolved from strictly a residential based program to, you know, having a drop in center, having a dedicated space, the recovery resource center at Eastman Hall, and then also having that housing component as well, we're really proud of. And we're, we're only one of 133 registered collegiate recovery programs in the country. I mean, that's out of what, 4,400 colleges and universities in the United States. It's pretty incredible uh, to have a program like this um, at St. Cloud State, really proud of it. So when it comes to that program, what would you say addiction is for the people who might not have like a general definition of it? And how would the St. Cloud State in that program help students in recovery, especially during the pandemic? So, you know, like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, you know, addiction is caused by a combination of behavioral, environmental, and biological factors. And so genetic, actually genetic risk, risk factors account for about 50% of the likelihood that someone will have a, a substance use disorder. So for those individuals, and I think I was one of those where, you know, that first drink or drug you take, you don't know how your brain's going to react. And for me, when I had my first drink when I was 12, it, I didn't become a full blown user, but I, I had that desire to chase that from the get go. So for a lot of us, we're, we don't have a choice, you know, it's just kind of what we, our biological makeup is. Um, and addiction is a brain disease because drugs change the brain. It changes its structure, how it works. And, you know, these changes can be long lasting, harmful. It can lead to some really self-destructive behaviors, you know, and left untreated, it's a progressive disease, you know, it gets worse and worse. And uh, unfortunately, it can lead to death. Uh, for the year ending in May 2020, that was the record for most overdose deaths in the United States. There were about over 81,000 uh, who died with from this disease. And that was like, if you remember, that's kind of the beginning of COVID. And so I'm anticipating probably another record coming up at the end of you know, 2021, May, 2021. And, um, you know, isolation, boredom, these are the main culprits for a lot of individuals who might've had some time in recovery, some good strong recovery time who return to use uh, because of their feeling hopeless, helpless. And we're creatures of habit. I think humans in general are, but especially us in recovery, we like our routines. We like our rituals and uh, this COVID really threw a wrench in that. And so we were, a lot of us were having a hard time adjusting. Uh, we loved the in-person contact and having kind of that forced isolation was, was difficult. So as far as our program, we really had to think critically um, on how to engage our students during this pandemic. So. I think it was when it really hit home for us here, I think it was during spring break last year. And so after that, we had to move operations virtually everything. I mean, we, I moved all of our, at the time we had five meetings, support group meetings. We moved all those virtually um, started a weekly game night, usually on Friday nights. We do a bit like a, I think Jackbox games. I think we used, we had that. And then, uh, you know, through CDC, trying to keep it everything safe. We, we would go on weekly walks together. We had some barbecues in the park. We had like a fish fry. Um, we'd go fishing too. We'd go fishing on the shore of the river. So trying to do stuff outside together um, was really, I think, critical. Our students really appreciated it. We didn't have any student return to use. And we still haven't, uh, yeah. which is like a really huge accomplishment. Thaddeus, um, you know, clinically, I, I can just confirm all the things that you're saying. Uh, the, the 
the, cl the students' clients who I have seen through the duration of COVID who are, are working on the recovery, that social isolation has been so difficult because the community that you create for these individuals um, and, and provide, I mean, just even a, just the space and, and the support um, was dramatically lost immediately when we all had to kind of go into hibernation and separate from each other. And so talk about trying to honor your recovery by yourself, which is not the way in which recovery is meant to do. <laughs> and so right. your creativity and your dedication and your flexibility with time and thinking outside the box has been incredible. So I just want to confirm well, all that you're saying is pretty phenomenal. I appreciate that, Charlene. You know, and it's for a lot of us, it's life and death. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, if some of us return to use, it could, especially if your substance of choice was opiates. That's, I mean, especially with the fentanyl out there right now, it's like playing Russian roulette. And so a return to use can, can be death uh, for some of us. So I really had to take it upon myself and work with the students and, and see what they wanted to do as far as engagement, having fun. And so, yeah, I think in general for us and our, us in recovery, it's been an adjustment. I think there's still right now there are meetings in person in the community, but most are virtual still. And it's for a lot of us and the feedback I hear from, from students and other community members, it's just, it's not the same. We like our in person, we like our hugging, you know, it, this stuff, it's just, it's, so it's been, a, it's been an adjustment, but I will say this, we're very resilient people in recovery. We're, we're very resilient and perseverant. Um, we've had to overcome a lot worse than a, a COVID-19 pandemic, and that was our own personal addiction. So we have kind of that thick skin too. So um, yeah. that yeah. helps. I, I know, Jordan, this is probably going to be your next question, but I, I, as I'm kind of thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the listener who may or may not um, have this experience um, or know of anyone who does. So if it's someone who's just really listening to learn more information, so what is recovery? Like what, how would you define recovery and are there different types of recovery? So there's a quote I like from Hazel and Betty Ford and they, they're kind of the, the main players in addiction treatment, but they, they care, they, define recovery as a voluntary, voluntarily maintained lifestyle composed of, composed and characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. There are about roughly 24 million Americans living in long-term recovery right now. Okay, so that's quite a bit, quite a bit of people who, who have had a substance use disorder and have committed to their recovery. There are different ways of finding recovery. And for most of us, it's abstaining from all mood and mind altering substances, but there are others right now, especially with the opiate crisis that are harm reduction approaches. Okay, so that's been a shift, I think, in the field. So harm reduction, so maybe an individual is smoking marijuana. There's also medically assisted treatment. So in that case too, especially with suffering with alcohol uh, misuse, um, opiate misuse, uh, there's methadone. Suboxone, naltrexone, these are medications that can help with cravings and help prevent an individual from, from using the harder narcotics, okay? For us in recovery and those that I work with, it really, you know, we really strive to live a life of emotional, physical, and spiritual wellness, you know, and how we, how we find that, a lot of us, we go to meetings, some of us go to church, a lot of service, uh, I think service is a big part of recovery for me personally, um, being selfless. I was selfish for so long in my addiction and being selfless and giving back and giving hope to others really gets rid of the shame and guilt and helps me embrace my narrative and helps me be proud of, of my journey because it's made me who I am today. And that's kind of what I try to instill in our students too. And we do even now with 
COVID, we, we do virtual shares. You know, we, we, we get some treatment centers virtually on and they mute their screen. And so we don't, you know, to, you know provide privacy, but we share our story and that really helps uplift us. Mm -hmm. um, there's no right or wrong way to find recovery. You know, that's one thing I want to say from the get-go. You know, there's individuals that are adamant that, you know, 12-step programs work. You know, your AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and that, that can work for some people, but for others, it might not work. And so we need to accommodate those that, that might, it might not fit. So that's why at the Recovery Resource Center, we offer different types of support group meetings. We have a group called All Recovery, which is a little more inclusive to not just substance use disorder, but other forms of recovery. We have a student that attends that with mental health issues. We've had gambling, sex uh, addictions in the past, uh, individuals with those conditions. And um, that meaning is it's all peer driven, check in, really chill. There's crosstalk. It's students really enjoy that meeting. And then we do, you know, we offer, you know, in, in St. Cloud, the community, there's uh, Smart Recovery, other Celebrate Recovery, which is faith-based. Yeah, there's no right or wrong way. And it's, uh, recovery is a process. It's, it's not an event. Um, it's a personal journey. So it's the responsibility of the person in recovery. It's, it's my responsibility. So, so Thaddeus, as, a, as, as an active minds, um, you know, to kind of live and breathe active minds and mental health panel, you know, here as your listeners here, as your supporters, here are themes of emotional health, mental health. Um, can you talk about how chemical health and mental health go hand in hand? Well, I think most of us, and I know me personally, I, I got into my addiction because I self-medicated. I used substances to to fill a void and that void was a spiritual deficiency as well as mental health issues I've always had anxiety depression as far back as I could remember and so for for a lot of us that's how we we coped with life is we use substances and you know recovery is not just giving up the drinking and the drugging I mean that's that's called sobriety, in my opinion. Recovery is a change in lifestyle, and it's holistic. It's it's mental health, physical health. You know, changing those coping skills, coping behaviors that we we utilize for a long time in active addiction is changing those things. Finding hobbies, finding fun things to do. It's it's a lot of it's it's a lot. It's you're you're starting, a lot of us are starting from square one. We have to, it's like baby steps. Mm -hmm. But uh, as time goes on, you know, we, it gets easier. Cravings start to go away. And we start to have fun again without substances. That's something I never thought would be a possibility personally. But uh, yeah, recovery is, uh, it's, it's action. It's doing, it's change. Change is scary, but uh, one thing too is we don't we don't do this alone. You know, there are people that help, whether that's therapists, support group meetings, treatment centers, peers. You know, and we're we're happy. You know, with our recovery resource center, your student in recovery, you come in our space, you're connected in with instant friends, instant people that. They're like-minded. They've been been there, done that. They understand your language. They understand what you're going through, and I think that's a great comfort because I I tried to do it alone. I tried to white knuckle it, and boy, it's hard. Some people can do it. Some people re recover naturally, what we call naturally. But I wasn't that person. I need to I need to be around other people in recovery, and I need to have that support and accountability too, which is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you know, Thaddeus, as, as we're ready to, to end, um, because I, we know that your time is valuable um, and, we'll, and let you continue on with your day. So as the, as the listener, I'm just thinking if, if there's a listener out there who has really been contemplating, I think I might have a, an, an issue with, um, with my chemical use. 
Um, it's COVID. I don't even know what to do. I don't know where to go. How would that listener, um, and, a, and as a student, how would how would that person reach out? Who would they reach out to? Yeah, that's a good question. One thing I will say is you are not alone. <laughs> you know, and I think when we're in the midst of an addiction or we're struggling with this, you know, um, with substances, we we feel alone. We feel isolated. We feel that we're there's something wrong with us and we're ashamed. We don't want to reach out. And what I hope, you know, and, you know, and it can be scary. And I think it's preventing a lot of individuals from getting the help they need is, is the stigma, you know? Um, so I encourage students to either, you know, connect with me, hopefully I'm not too intimidating, but uh, if not uh, connect with a loved one, someone that you trust, could be a, a you know a student faculty staff what have you but um, come to the resource center you know our support group meetings are open meetings meaning that you don't need to identify as someone with a substance use disorder you could come as a as a visitor or observer as well so if that makes you feel more comfortable accessing our space feel free to bring someone with you and um, yeah it's. I will say that it can be pretty daunting doing that, uh, but once you come, you'll you'll feel good, and you'll feel like, oh, I'm not I'm not alone in this, and you'll see other students in in there who you never would have thought were struggling. Because let's face it, addiction does not discriminate. <laughs> you know, any walk of life can have this disease and can struggle. So. I think that's the main thing is knowing you're not alone and we can do this together. You know, I wish I could talk more. There's so many, you sent me so many great questions just to like the do's and don'ts of, you know, uh, trying to support someone in, in, in their recovery. I will say this really quick, just to touch on that. Just don't use non use non-judgmental words. I think language is a big part of, uh, of just helping to stigmatize things. We really want to use, person first language, you know, stigmatizing language really perpetuates the negative perception. So addict, alcoholic, or you're an abuser, you know, that kind of implies blame on somebody. So we, we really try to use like person first language, like person with a substance use disorder, um, person struggling with substance misuse, risky use, harmful use, things like that. Um, so there's so many ways, like, so I will, I will put a little commercial in there. So like, especially like active minds, if you want, we, I do a recovery ally training and I do it for faculty staff more so as the audience, but I do tailor it to students as well. So it's just a better way to understand how to support someone better who, who is either in recovery or who might be currently struggling with the substance use disorder. So I'll throw that out there if, if you want one of these days I could do it virtually too, no problem. But I talk, I touch on language, I talk, touch on the d disease model, how to get into treatment, what, what are the types of treatment? So things of that sort. And then I also touch on the resources we offer uh, students here at St. Cloud State, so. I think that's awesome, thank you. Yes, we have, we had, we have so many questions that of course we couldn't get to all of them because of time. Um, thank you for touching on all that you did. Um, you, you're such a resource. Uh, and, and as part of this podcast, we will certainly post this on our so social media sites and we'll include your contact information um, as well as the contact information for, for the Counseling Center um, for those who feel like they have a, um, one, feel like it's time to address their mental health and their chemical health. So we will definitely, um, provide that resource um, for those who are interested or for those who may have someone who think they could benefit um, as, as an ally. So thank yeah, let's you. think about, let's think about the, like collaborating on an event or advocacy initiative. Let's do something before, I don't know if, what you have planned this semester, but maybe we can do something Yeah. Um, towards the end of the semester. Right. So right. it'd be good to, to keep, keep the connection going and because I mean like you said mental health substance use disorder they go hand in hand and I think it's important the strength in numbers I think we we get 
and I'm, I'm a victim of this too. We, we get caught up in our work and we, we kind of go into our little silos and, mm-hmm. you know, I think especially conditions like ours, with, which are very stigmatized. And I think the more voices, the more faces and voices we could put out there and show like, Hey, recovery works, whether that's mental health or substance use disorder, the better, the better off we'll be yeah, working together. So for sure. So Alexis, I'll t- hand it over to you as one of the co-presidents to just kind of wrap us up. Well, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I, I learned something more about addiction today and I learned more about the resources that we have on campus. Like I'm familiar with the recovery community, but I, I did know that all the things you offered. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this today. Um, I think that's a wrap. Uh, I'll put resources in the comments if anybody is interested, as well as Thaddeus's contact information. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks again for the opportunity. Bye. Go Huskies. <laughs>